Siegel and the Apple Student Committee on Outstanding Teaching. I would like to thank all of you for coming out tonight and supporting both the awards and this year's recipient, Professor Terry Johnson from the UC Berkeley Department of Bioengineering. When I was sitting at my laptop earlier this evening trying to figure out what I want to say in my introduction, since I'm compelled to make one, I considered the various topics I could focus on. I could list all of Professor Johnson's many and varied achievements. I could weave in little anecdotes from your nominations from his students that shared and that they shared that illustrated his dedication to promoting and fostering an intellectual community here at Cal that is not only positive but vibrant. I even debated with myself about trying to retell the history of the ASUC Golden Apple Award in a unique way, but I ruled that out since everyone interested could just read it for themselves on our website listed on our, your programs. So instead I'm going to focus on a topic that many of you may be tired of hearing about, but I ask you to bear with me tonight. We have heard so many debates from all four corners of campus that have expanded into the state capital about the financial situation of our nation and the consequences it foreshadows for our public education system. I myself, far from being an economics expert, have even attempted to engage in debates centering on seeking possible solutions to our financial uncertainty. So how, do you ask, is this relevant to the ASUC Golden Apple Award? For me, it became clear when I recalled a speech from last year's committee chairs. As a graduating senior, he confessed that when faced with rising tuition fees, limited classes, and daunting waiting lists, the nominations themselves touched him, for they were a testament to the work our professors, on a daily basis, do, in spite of all the hardships and obstacles we all face. In every department, countless professors go above and beyond each day to provide the best learning experience they can for their students. These are the professors that will expand classes to accommodate students. These are the professors that take time out of their busy lives to sit with a student and discuss issues outside of the classroom just to make sure their student is all right. And these are the professors we seek to honor with the ASUC Golden Apple Award. And faced with the financial situation, I believe the award has even more significance today. It is our way as students to thank our professors for believing in us and for always being there for us. It is for the extra time they spend with us in office hours to help us through a difficult concept from lecture or simply to provide us with recommendations for graduate studies. These professors are lost in the numbers analyzed by certain politicians or economic analysts, and the award, however, brings these professors and the extraordinary devotion to their students to the forefront, even if only for just one night out of the year. And that is why we are here tonight, to bring one such professor into the spotlight, to thank him with this award, humble as it is, for his dedication, for his continued support to all of us, for his perseverance through obstacles and hardships that might have broken others, and finally to tell him that what he has done for us has not gone unobserved, and we are truly grateful that he has honored us by being part of the UC Berkeley faculty. So tonight, I ask all of you to please join me in giving a warm welcome in true Berkeley fashion to the 2010 Golden Apple Award recipient, Professor Terry Johnson. Um, it is always important uh, to have an opportunity to find out that we're getting through to you. Um, grades are one thing, but grades don't tell all of the story. Uh, part of being a teacher is to uh, take all of the knowledge that's out there, all of the knowledge that is available, and to package it together into uh, collections that are both useful to you and interesting to you, uh, that are functional in the real world, that are functional in graduate school and functional in med school, but we also hope that we can accidentally inspire you along the way. And uh, uh, I would like to, to thank all of the student effort that went into this. 
Um, you guys have a tremendous amount of work to do. I know that because I see uh, all of the applications, or I see many of the applications, um, and I know that you have a tremendous amount of work to do at the end of the semester because I am responsible for some of it. <laughs> uh, the fact that you were able to take the time out uh, despite all of that for something like this means a lot to me. So thank you all very much. So this is an interesting kind of talk. Most of the talks that I, I give uh, are designed around certain concepts or uh, general concepts that I think can be explained within an entire lecture. But if the, uh, this is the last lecture that I'm going to be able to give, I want the opportunity to tackle subjects that are very large, that are larger than uh, you would typically attempt to attack in a single lecture. And uh, we'll see how this goes. I think it's important to talk first a little bit about me. Because if this is my last lecture, <laughs> gosh darn it, it's going to be my last opportunity. But I hope to tie it in to uh, uh, the conclusions that I will come to reach. So very briefly, um, I started out uh, in science in the chemical engineering department at Wayne State University for my bachelor's degree. While I was working there, I worked with a contract company uh, that did some environmental engineering for General Motors. This was the operation building in General Motors downtown Detroit. And I'd been working there for a while, and it was a good job, um, but I decided for various reasons that it was not for me. <laughs> and I wanted to do something different. And I decided at that point, thank you very much. Yeah. And I decided at that point to pursue study in graduate school, which I expected would be something like this. <laughs> uh, it was interesting. At that point, I thought that I would become a uh, professor instead of a lecturer. I thought that I would become sort of uh, uh, the job that I knew as opposed to the job that I didn't know existed yet. Uh, and I ended up going to MIT, <laughs> where we uh, like to take statues on the Harvard campus and dress them up as video game characters. <laughs> While I was there, um, I worked on tissue engineering of the liver. <laughs> this is Prometheus. Prometheus uh, was uh, basically chained because he gave fire to humanity, uh, and he would have his liver pecked out by a bird every day, and the bird would take off, and the liver would regrow. So it has a little something to do with uh, uh, the research I was talking about. I also bring this up because occasionally grad school feels a lot like this. <laughs> And I was considering this project, and the project was not exactly for me, but more importantly, I was finding that I didn't really want to become a professor. And uh, I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. I was considering going back into industry in a slightly different field, but um, I had had an opportunity, this is a, uh, the Eye of Jupiter, I had an opportunity to uh, teach a class while I was in graduate school. Um, in, actually, I was at GSI, uh, and I really enjoyed GSIing that course. Partially because I really liked the subject, but more importantly because I felt like I knew the subject better through teaching it than I ever would have known otherwise. I'd actually found the best way for me to learn, and I'd like to thank you guys, because without you, uh, I know that I would know a lot less than I do today. Um, I took this opportunity uh, uh, within the department to teach a couple of courses in numerical methods, which sort of brought me back to my roots. And from here, I taught a couple of semesters there in Boston. I moved here at the very beginning of 2001, where I've taught a number of courses in the bioengineering department. So why do I bring this up? I bring this up because teaching came to me at a time where I needed it. So I, I hope that I'm able to pay teaching back uh, occasionally, uh, because it's been very important to me. Um, I want to discuss a little bit about what I teach. Believe those who are seeking the truth, doubt those who find it. It's a very good quote for a scientist. Um, I know that we have uh, uh, some people outside of the College of Engineering, so uh, and most of us might be familiar with this. This is uh, the allegory of the cave from Plato, where we have these prisoners who are chained in the cave, and they're only able to see this uh, side of the cave on the right, 
the real world is out here. And all they're seeing of the real world are shadows that are cast on the wall from the fire back there. They don't really know what's going on. Um, Plato talks about this because he's interested in uh, uh, basically uh, uh, convincing people to consider his theory of the forms. That there are these immutable forms out there that we can understand through philosophy. And to be a philosopher is to, lead, to stop being a prisoner and to join the real world. Now, I don't necessarily agree with the theory of the forms, but I think that this allegory discusses a lot of the problems that we have in science and problems that come up in our actual lives. So what does a scientist do? Is it discovering the truth? Well, a scientist has the universe and wants to know it. <laughs> so the scientist can look at the universe, and the scientist can ponder. And it would seem, uh, according to philosophy, that it would be that easy. And it's definitely not that simple, because there's a lot between us and the universe. So what's between us and the universe? Well, the universe is filled with electromagnetic radiation. We <laughs> can detect this tiny slice of what's going on. Of all the things that are happening visually, we can detect hardly any of that. Now, the same is true of sound. Of all the vibrations that are out there, we can perceive only a tiny fraction of them. Of all the molecules that are floating around in this room, we can only sense through smell a tiny amount of them based on the receptors that we have. So based on the way that we're built, our perception of what's going on is necessarily limited. But it's actually must work much worse than that. <laughs> because we are not statues. We're not the thinker. We are brains. We evolved. We're human beings. And with that, we have a certain amount of baggage in understanding the world. For example, we are social animals. <laughs> and because we are social animals, there are certain things that we are irrational about when you talk about the group. We uh, have a tendency to believe authority, perhaps, more often than we should, for example. Uh, on top of that, we are terrible at, excess, uh, at deciding about risk and reward. We're not very good at this. We're not necessarily rational. And all these might have had advantages when we were evolving, but they're not necessarily advantages when trying to look in the world in a purely rational sense. And lastly, we're not designed to understand the universe. We have Schrodinger's cat right here, the famous example of uh, quantum mechanics. And effectively, it means that the universe, at its root, works in a way that we are not necessarily designed to consider. We consider this a paradox, even though, as far as we know, this seems to be the way the universe works. Why do we consider it a paradox? Because all of our experience in life, and all of our experience throughout evolution, has not necessarily told us that we should be thinking about cats that are half alive and half dead, depending on whether we've opened a box or not. <laughs> so we have a lot of problems. But as scientists, perhaps we should not be focusing on the search for truth, or we should not be focusing on uh, the uh, uh, achievement of truth, but on its search. We should be focusing on uh, attempting to come closer to the truth and not become so obsessed about actually reaching it. And I think that this is one of the strengths of science, and it's also a strength in, in thinking in ordinary life. So what can science do? We've got these walls between us and the universe, but science can help us with them. Mathematics. Now, mathematics is, in and of itself, an art. And I'm not talking about the only thing that mathematics does, but it's something that I do think mathematics does, is that it allows us to put a structure on the universe that is useful, and it's a structure that makes it hard to cheat. Now, <laughs> anyone who is poli-sci may wonder, because they, they have studied politicians uh, and their use of statistics, may suggest that this is not necessarily always going to work. And this is absolutely true. Mathematics is not capable of erasing our biases. But it may make that wall a little clearer. Clearer than, I expect, uh, a simply narrative view of what's going on. At the same time, engineering can take a look at all of these things that we can't sense, and it can build devices that allow us to look at things that we couldn't look at directly. Now, we'll never be able to completely erase our bias, and we'll never be able to completely view the universe, but hopefully through a combination of engineering and mathematics, we'll be able to see, however dimly, a better view of what's actually out there. So the thing that I would like to say, if this is my last lecture, 
is that I think that uh, everybody in this room should be congratulated, not just the scientists and the engineers, but everybody in this room should be congratulated for being part of a culture that has embarked on such a grand and noble enterprise as this. And I would like to say, if this is my last lecture, that I know that I leave this enterprise in hands more capable of mine. So congratulations. I think that this general idea was put best by Galen in the second century. Galen was a physician, but what he said about the art of medicine, I think is also true about the art of science. He said, life is short, the art is long, opportunity is fleeting, experience is delusive, and judgment is difficult. Now he said this about medicine, but do you consider it? Life is short and the art is long. There's not much, it seems, that we can actually accomplish in a universe as complicated as ours in a single lifetime. But as part of the art, we can accomplish much because we are working together as uh, people trying to understand the universe. And in working together, we can accomplish a great deal. Um, opportunity is fleeting. Galen was talking about if a patient comes to you, you might actually see that patient at a point uh, where the uh, fever has broken, but the spots remain. You don't have every step of the disease. You don't understand everything about it. So the opportunity to observe is fleeting. And we know as uh, experimentalists that this is obviously, obviously true. It's very difficult to actually get uh, extremely good facts about anything. Um, experience is delusive. And this goes back to the mathematics we were talking about earlier. Uh, if you tend to think about um, uh, your own experience as completely paramount, in your experience, rare things will happen. And if you think that those rare things are necessarily important, you can make serious mistakes. Judgment is difficult for all of these reasons. So I think that this is important to think about when we're thinking about a search for truth. We want to approach truth. We want to come ever closer to truth. But I don't think necessarily that we should hold ourselves to uh, uh, finding truth. And I've said that Galen was uh, a great thinker in this. He was a physician. Um, and he was, in many points, uh, completely wrong. For example, William Harvey, uh, the father of circulation, 1,500 years later. Um, Galen had written that, uh, and I'll simplify slightly, but Galen had written that blood was created in the liver, and then it was sent to the rest of the body, and it was burned kind of like fuel. And I want you to keep in mind that for 1,500 years, not only was this believed, this was every serious physician would tell you this, that blood was created in the liver and then it just burned away. And William Harvey, 1,500 years later, said, well, I'm going to take a heart, cadaver heart, I'm going to fill it with water, I'm going to squeeze the water out, two ounces of water. Okay, two ounces of water times the number of heartbeats in a day is a heck of a lot of blood. In fact, it weighs more than most people. In fact, it weighs more than all people. What does that mean? It means with a very simple argument based on mathematics and reason, 1,500 years of established dogma can be torn down. Now, Harvey had a heck of a time actually convincing anybody of this. Mm -hmm. But it was well worth it. Because can you imagine if today we were attempting in modern medicine to follow this theory along? It's a very powerful technique. And it's ever improving. It's ever changing. So. Uh, I think that's all I want to say about science, but uh, if I'm giving my last lecture, I should probably say something about my philosophy. I probably should say something about my philosophy, but I'm not necessarily convinced I have one. And I'm okay with that. Um, the fact that I cannot describe my philosophy to you uh, in uh, a short lecture could mean one of two things. One, it could mean that I'm extraordinarily deep, and there's a lot there. <laughs> Two, it could mean that I'm extraordinarily uh, unintrospective. Uh, three, some combination thereof. And actually, I think this is OK, because I'm not here to deliver truth. However, I think that I can deliver a couple of pieces of information that I believe very strongly. And if I can't give you a philosophy, maybe I can give you some data that will help you to form a model of something that would approach my philosophy in time. <laughs> so first of all, as your education increases, 
your ability will increase. If it doesn't, that might be our fault. But <laughs> I strongly suspect that this is the case. But at the same time, your humility should increase. Because the more that you know, the more you will find that you don't know. The more you will find that you can never know. The more you can find uh, that humility in the fact of all of these things that are known and how somebody took a massive amount of unknowns and was able to put them together and crystallize them into what we have today as knowledge. And I think this combination of ability and humility will serve you very well because you have to have the ability to do anything. And the ability will give you the strength to do things. But you're also going to need the humility to know when you've reached your limit, to know when you should collaborate with somebody else, to know when you have to sit back and read a little more, to basically be able to plan your life when you're attacking problems or considering things. Lastly, as your education increases, your responsibility increases. Everybody in this room is here for two reasons. First, you're very good. Second, you're very lucky. I include myself in that, especially the second one. Why are you lucky? You were born at the right place, at the right time, to have the opportunities of an education that will allow you to do great things. And I think that with that responsibility comes responsibility to attempt to do great things. <laughs> ambitiousness of an undertaking. <laughs> so as the uh, ambitiousness of an undertaking increases, the chance of failure increases. You can see over uh, on the y-axis, 0% chance of failure, it's going to work, no problem. 100% chance of failure, there's no way it's going to work. I would suggest it looks something like this. <laughs> now why would I put this up? This seems kind of obvious. Because I do want to point out that I believe that this is the optimal ambitiousness for its success. <laughs> the thing you will notice about the optimal ambitiousness is that it has you failing a lot. <laughs> this is really important. Um, it is easy to put yourself into a kind of life and to deal with the kinds of projects that you will always be able to handle successfully. It is very difficult to grow personally in such an environment. I consider myself very fortunate that I am in a place where almost everyone is smarter than I am, so I have to work very hard to catch up with them. And I would not be who I am today if I were not in such an environment. So I strongly suggest to everybody here, be prepared to fail on a regular basis. That is a good thing. The last thing I want to say, I'll use a Venn diagram. I haven't been able to use this in class in a while. <laughs> This is the Venn diagram, the set of all stuff that we taught you. This is the stuff that you will go out to prove is bogus, suboptimal, or incomplete. You will prove us wrong, you will prove us not as good as you, and you will prove us not so bad, but needing a little bit of extra help in areas. The intersection of these two is the real reason why you are here. You're part of this enterprise. And what you're going to do when you go out there is you're going to tell us where we are wrong. And then, hopefully, uh, academia is going to listen and they're going to incorporate the things that you've done into the teachings for the generation that comes after you. And with this, we will iteratively improve and come closer to the truth, even if we'll never quite reach it. And that is due to your hard work, in part. Um, I'd like to close with the best advice I've ever heard. Twelve words that cannot go wrong in any situation. Listen to everyone, follow no one, look for patterns, work like hell. <laughs> <laughs> Lastly, I'd like to thank everybody here for coming and uh, for making this possible. It was an honor and a privilege, uh, as it is to teach, but especially to come here tonight. Thank you.
I'll contact you when we'll get started. Also, nominations are open in spring 2011 for next year. Finally, our website is also a list of programs. If you would like to not take your programs home, there's a basket outside on the door. Your jeep will show it to you, and it's the recycling programs basket. So thank you once again for coming out tonight, and see you guys next year. Thank you.